going on, guys? Thank you so very much for joining me right here on Off The Script. I am JD from New York, and I'm bringing you the latest in WWE news and rumors. Starting off here with Shotzi Blackheart, man. Shotzi Blackheart, everybody's favorite in NXT. I don't know about you guys, but I know me. One of my personal favorites in the women's division on Wednesday nights. She had her car stolen last week. Yes, stolen. Right out from underneath her, right in front of her own home. Inside the vehicle was all of her wrestling gear, including her actual gear, her jacket, and her very important helmet that she wears down to the ring while driving her miniature tank. Local police officers found the car. They saved the day a few days later, and she posted a video on her YouTube channel on Thursday after she got a call from the police Wednesday evening while brushing her teeth, getting ready for last week's NXT tapings at full sail. There was some minor damage to the front of the vehicle, but that's not even the issue here. She didn't give a shit about the vehicle as long as she got her helmet back. The helmet is so important to her, and she went over why in this video, and I talked about it on Off The Script. You guys can go check that down in the playlist below in this very video. So the helmet, she got the helmet back, but that's not before Triple H actually got her a new helmet made. On Monday, Blackheart took to our official Twitter account where she passed along a very touching thing that Triple H did for her while the car was missing because her ring gear and her iconic helmet were stolen. At the time, he had the NXT team make a new helmet for her to use on NXT TV. As you guys can see right there in the tweet, she had a new helmet and she says this, and I quote, I didn't get to wear this, but it came with a really awesome story. So I wanted to share, as soon as Triple H found out about my car and helmet, he made sure that I had help and had the crew put this together for me in time for my match filmed only one day after it was stolen. Heart emoji. This is a great story, man. You go and get your car stolen and your boss is just as upset for your helmet as you are and he takes it upon himself to get you a new helmet made because he knows how important the old helmet was to her. A lot of people want to shit on Triple H, but at the end of the day, he always says that that NXT locker room is like a family and he is the father. So that's good on him for doing that. Obviously, the new helmet wouldn't have replaced the old helmet, but he went out of his way to make sure that she had a signature helmet. If she did indeed go and lose the old one, obviously with all the memories that she would not be able to get back, those memories would live here. And he got a new helmet made, and those memories would live on in the new helmet. She'd make new memories on NXT and in the WWE as she eventually gets called up to the main roster with the new helmet, man. Really great story there by Shotzi Blackheart. I wish her nothing but the continued success on NXT, and I can't wait to see what she does on Wednesday nights, moving on into the future. From one story with Shotzi Blackheart that ended in a happy ending to another story with Sonya Deville that now includes new bone-chilling information. Mandy Rose was actually at Sonya's house the night of the home invasion. New information has come out regarding the situation over the weekend when a stalker showed up at Sonya Deville's house in Florida. Philip A. Thomas II traveled from South Carolina to Deville's home after spending several months planning to kidnap her. He gained entry into the house through a patio screen, but fortunately Deville managed to leave the house without being harmed. The local police had now confirmed that Thomas was carrying a knife plastic zip ties, duct tape, mace, and other personal items. He allegedly admitted that he planned on taking DeVille hostage. The good news is that he was later arrested and charged with aggravated stalking, armed burglary of a dwelling, attempted armed kidnapping, and criminal mischief. The Tampa Bay Times has an article up as of Tuesday afternoon with details from DeVille trying to get a court petition seeking protection. The document also outlines the threatening messages that Thomas had sent to DeVille prior to this situation. A court motion that prosecutors later filed to hold Thomas without bail revealed that a friend 
who was with DeVille on the night of this situation was indeed Mandy Rose, real name Amanda Sacamano. What are you doing? What do you want? DeVille yelled at this creep as he stared at her from just four feet away before he began walking towards her. That is when I realized that this person in the picture that you're looking at right now, this asshole, that this person was not here to rob me, but he was here to hurt me. Now, the nature of the other messages were from obsessive to suicidal to idolize. And one message that Sonya received said this, and I quote, you are the only person I will ever love. She saw another account without a profile photo, of course. I mean, how many of those exist on social media? How many fan bases have that type of person? How many of those exist on Twitter? She saw another account without a profile photo that contained what she described as similar grammar and disturbingly threatening. The last message from that account, Bernardo wrote, arrived on 12.16 a.m. Sunday, and said, and I quote, look outside, baby, by your pool, I'm here. I'm going to kill that little bitch you have inside with you. So this guy was sending messages as he was physically there on her property. Other messages from that account began on July 5th to Sonya's Instagram. One stated, I found your home address, one said, and included the address of the residence. The other message is included by the sender, threaten to decapitate, yes, decapitate, or go after Sony's friends and relatives by name, and describe sex acts. One message also included a photo of his penis. Sonia said, I'm a public figure with a social media following of almost one million, so all of his messages were in my request folder, which is filled with thousands of messages from people I do not follow. Now. According to the, to the arrest report and the motion filed by prosecutors, Thomas actually admitted to driving from South Carolina to Sonia's home. He parked his car at a local church a couple miles away, walked to her home with a knife, mace, plastic zip ties, window punches, and duct tape. Now, the original story stated that he cut a hole in the patio screen, remained on the patio three to four hours while watching and listening through the windows until they went to sleep. After Sonia and Mandy fled, Thomas remained in the house thinking that they were upstairs hiding. Now the defendant admitted that his intention was to take Sonia hostage by spraying her with pepper spray, binding her hands with zip ties, and wrapping duct tape around her arms to prevent from fighting back. He stated that he intended to keep Sonia hostage preventing her from attending a planned event scheduled for the following week, which I'm assuming is SummerSlam, and that he was not going to leave her residence without her answering all of his questions. So Sonya and Mandy, obviously, as you guys know, are in SummerSlam hair versus hair match on Sunday. A judge granted Bernardo's handwritten request for a temporary injunction against stalking violence. Thomas remained in jail on Tuesday on charges of armed kidnapping, aggravated stalking, and armed burglary of a dwelling. All felonies and criminal mischief a misdemeanor. A hearing is scheduled Thursday on the prosecution motion to prevent Thomas' release on bail. The motion says the only way to keep Baronado and the public safe is to hold Thomas because he is a long-term obsession or has a long-term obsession with Sony Deville the anger displayed in the messages and the lengths to which Thomas went to plan and conduct the kidnapping were just absolutely on another level. This is absolutely ridiculous. All this new information coming out about this guy, I don't know what else to add on top of what I've already stated in the last off the script extra. It could be a much worse situation than what I'm reading right now. We legitimately came this close from reporting both Sony DeVille and Mandy Rose's murder. That's exactly what we would be sitting here talking about right now if police did not arrive on the scene in a swift fashion. This is fucking scary. Unbelievable. All I can say is that I am very happy that both Mandy and Sony DeVille 
are both safe. I can't wait to see them perform on Sunday night. I want you guys to think back to 2016. I want you guys to think back to how great SmackDown was in 2016. Following that 2016 draft, SmackDown was producing some of the best shows that SmackDown has ever seen. That entire second half of the year felt like NXT on the main roster. And that's when Monday Night Raw stocked their roster on USA. And SmackDown got all of the B-level players, all of the up-and-comers that nobody really knew. And they ended up putting on better television than Monday Night Raw. Another thing that came from that great era of SmackDown was Talking Smack. Talking Smack was great. Everybody, everybody loved Talking Smack because it was unscripted. It broke kayfabe just a little bit. You got to see all of the superstars on SmackDown in their real life personas. They were talking normally. They were chill and laid back. Nothing was scripted. Everybody just went in there and had fun and were genuine. They acted like themselves. Vince McMahon caught wind of this. He didn't like that the show was breaking the fourth wall. Canceled the show in 2017. People are still, to this day, wondering what happened. Why? Why would he do that? It was so popular. I miss it. I got some good news. WWE may be bringing back Talking Smack. PW Insider reported that Tuesday, on Tuesday, the WWE Network may soon revive Talking Smack and the revival may be as soon as the end of August. The show was canceled in July of 2017. Per the report, there's been internal talk of reviving Talking Smack as far back as January 2020, but the company has not pulled the trigger. It was added that now it appears that the time is closer than ever to revive Talking Smack. The show was hosted, as you guys know, by Renee Young and then... SmackDown General Manager Daniel Bryan when it first launched in August of 2016. Some great moments on that show. The unscripted nature of the show, like I said, was really attractive to a lot of viewers. There were various memorable segments, including when Bryan and The Miz had a heated exchange that fans, you know, were thinking, hey, if this is what they're doing on the show, this could lead to Bryan coming out of retirement and him coming out of retirement at WrestleMania against The Miz... So they had that entire just storyline just going and going and going and generating interest. Even though it didn't lead to anything, it was one of the most talked about moments of the entire year. This was at a time where Brian had to retire due to WWE not clearing him because of his history with concussions. Now WWE has Raw Talk now on Mondays following Raw and airs on both the free and paid tiers of the WWE Network. I don't know... If it's going to be the same deal with Talking Smack, I would assume so. But like I said with Raw Talk, I have not watched one episode of Raw Talk. I will never watch one episode of Raw Talk. I will probably not watch another episode of Talking Smack, this revised version of Talking Smack, because do you honestly think WWE is going to go back and give you the same genuine, heartfelt, fucking laid back and chill Talking Smack that you got in 2016? Of course not. This is something that WWE is simply cashing in on, and they know the fans want it. They are doing anything possible right now to generate interest in the product, and if that means bringing back a dead concept that they themselves killed for no reason, something that the fans still ask for today, then that's exactly what they're going to do. And that's exactly what they're doing with Talking Smack. I don't see this being the genuine... You know, happy-go-lucky, fucking laid-back, chill show that we got in 2016. This is going to be just as scripted as everything else on WWE television. And at that point, is it even worth it? Why would you go out of your way to watch and invest in what they're doing? You may watch episode one and come to the conclusion that, hey, JD said this. He actually, actually ended up being right. I know I'm going to end up being right. WWE does not do anything laid back and genuine and they hate breaking the fourth wall. They hate breaking kayfabe. They may be as illogical as fucking ever, but that doesn't mean that they are hip and cool and that they want to give the fans what they want. This is just another reason that WWE is showing how desperate they are and they need something to generate interest for an overly dying product, especially on Friday nights. You know, one may ask... How much worse can WWE programming get 
going on into the rest of 2020 and then on into 2021. All you got to do is bring up Bill Goldberg's name because he'll be around for at least two more years. Bill Goldberg was interviewed on the Pop Culture Show where he spoke about a wide range of topics, including his WWE contract. During the interview, he was asked about his status with the company. This is where he stated that he's still in the contract for two more years. And he also confirmed that the contract sees him work two matches per year. So I guess this year, at least we're safe. Next year, my God, man, more Bill Goldberg in 2021. He got his match in February with The Fiend, buried him. He took care of Braun Strowman. Or actually, Braun Strowman took care of him. Either way, Goldberg is done for 2020. Thank Christ. I am contracted with WWE for the next two years through 2022 and 2023. I've got two matches per year. I've exhausted my limit this year quite early. Thank God. At WrestleMania, under these really weird circumstances, but I've got a couple of other extremely interesting projects right on the cusp, he says. But as you guys know, in the entertainment business right now, everything's on hold unless it's a production of 10 or under, pretty much. We've got a lot of cool things that people are going to find out about pretty soon. My WWE commitment is still going strong at 53. I never would have imagined, especially after making fun of Flair when he was doing it in his early 40s, end quote. This guy needs to go away. He is absolutely one of the worst aspects of the pro wrestling business. I will never forgive him for coming back and doing what he did against Bray Wyatt. A man of that type of fucking status in the industry is going to come on in and take a world championship away from, from Bray Wyatt without actually saying something. Hey, Vince, I think this is wrong. I went over this time and time again. I think this is wrong. Maybe we shouldn't bring me in here to take the title off your new up-and-coming character. I don't understand it. I'll never get over it. I will always consider that one of the worst booking decisions in the history of pro wrestling. That is a moment that you're going to look back on when The Fiend is dead. The burial of The Fiend? That was stage two of The Fiend's burial. Hell in a Cell with Seth Rollins was stage one. Now, this is not the only Goldberg news this week. Apparently... Tony Khan wanted to bring in Goldberg into AEW. Now, Jim Cornette spoke about Tony Khan wanting Goldberg, and I don't know how he knows what Tony Khan would have done with Bill Goldberg. I don't think Jim Cornette is a part of the elite's group texts via iPhone or Google devices. I don't see Jim Cornette being in that inner circle, so I don't know how he knows. It's probably just making an assumption just to get his opinion out there because he knows his opinion is going to be picked up by some fucking dirt sheet. But Jim Cornette said, Khan wanted to bring in Goldberg and have him go on a long undefeated streak like he did over 20 years ago in WCW. Here's what Cornette said about the Tony Khan, Bill Goldberg matter on his podcast. And I quote, Goldberg was huge on Tony Khan's want list. He wanted Goldberg to come out and do the streak all over again. I mentioned how much you think he's going to charge for a 30-second job match. Probably the same as a main event pay-per-view match. End quote. I doubt that was the plan for Bill Goldberg. Why would you go and blatantly do the same thing that WCW did when you know exactly all the comparisons to WCW are going to be brought upon AEW and Tony Khan? That's not exactly the look and the image that they want or the type of attention that they want. It's been done. Why are you going back and possibly doing something that was already done 20 years ago a lot better than it ever could be done? Now, if Goldberg was coming on in, I would say Bill Goldberg would be used as a part-time guy maybe once or twice a year exactly the way he's used in WWE, unfortunately. So Jim Cornette, I don't think Jim Cornette knows anything. Jim Cornette is shit, and I think he's just saying shit to get attention from the dirt sheets because they usually pick up on all the controversial shit that he says on his podcast. So I don't think Tony Khan would have done that, and Goldberg 
with two years left on his WWE contract, two matches per year. Folks, just let this sink in. We got four more Goldberg matches in WWE awaiting us. My God, man. Can you hand me the fucking bleach now, please? Please? Can we not wait till Saudi Arabia? And in the final news story of this OTS Extra, WWE changes stipulation for SummerSlam match between Seth Rollins and Dominic Mysterio. Now, I'm assuming you guys did not watch Monday Night Raw, and by the looks of the ratings, I am probably right on that. A lot of people didn't watch Monday Night Raw. But, oh, by the way, that third hour drew the worst third hour rating in the history of WWE programming. So, going on into SummerSlam, I don't think that's a good look, Bruce. WWE had a contract signing last week with Seth Rollins and Dominic Mysterio. One contract was for Dominic to become a WWE superstar. The other contract was a match contract at SummerSlam for Dominic against Seth Rollins. Now... On Saturday, which everything breaks on social media, so if you weren't on social media and you didn't watch Monday Night Raw, be lucky that I'm here. On Saturday, WWE announced that the match will now be a street fight, as you guys can see in the tweet right there. It is now a street fight, and this will mark the first match for Dominic inside of a WWE ring. Now, I like this because it's going to hide Dominic's weaknesses. Dominic, we all know, I don't know how good of a wrestler he is. He may not be good at all. But you're asking him to go into a one-on-one -on -one match with Seth Rollins at SummerSlam. I don't think that's a good look for the youngster for his big debut at WWE's second biggest pay-per-view of the year. Nobody is going to think Dominic is going to be able to hang with Seth Rollins in a one-on-one -on -one match in a standard match at SummerSlam. So giving him a stipulation or a weapon... A, it gives him an opportunity to hide those weaknesses, and B, it gives him a legit shot, a believable shot, to actually win the match. Because we all know that it would be ridiculous if Dominic Mysterio beat Seth Rollins in a one-on-one -on -one match. That's why they are doing it. I don't mind that. I don't mind that. The rest of SummerSlam looks like this. Drew McIntyre versus Randy Orton for the WWE Championship. Braun Strowman versus Bray Wyatt for the Universal Championship. Street Profits versus Andrade and Garza for the Raw Tag Team Championships. Apollo Crews versus MVP for the United States Championship. Seth Rollins versus Dominic in a street fight. Bailey versus Asuka for the SmackDown Women's Championship. Sasha Banks versus Asuka for the Raw Women's Championship. And Mandy Rose versus Sonya Deville in a hair versus hair match. Doesn't sound like SummerSlam to me, folks. I can see why Monday Night Raw and SmackDown are drawing the worst ratings of all time. WWE put just a little bit more effort into their weekly shows and a little bit more effort into SummerSlam. I wouldn't be here every fucking Tuesday or Wednesday or whenever the ratings drop and laughing at the fact that Monday Night Raw continues to dig themselves a deeper grave. But I always enjoy a good laugh. And that's why I have Alvarez on Twitter, usually breaking the news. I look at it, I laugh, ha ha ha, and I feel vindicated. And I feel validated. I love it. I love it. It's one of my favorite times of the new week. Looking at the raw ratings hit all-time lows. Guys, I'm getting out of here. Hopefully you enjoyed the podcast, well not really a podcast, the video. A news video, news brief, whatever you want to call it. I will be back tomorrow with something, I don't know what. But we'll see. Maybe NXT Live, depending on how good it... Actually, no. I'm doing live NXT on Wednesday night because there's no fucking dynamite. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'll be live on Wednesday night with NXT Live. Jesse and I will be going over NXT. And then Thursday, I may take the day off. I may take the fucking day off, bro. Anyway, hit that thumbs up. And make sure you guys are subscribed down below for all the news and information breaking in WWE. I will be... Always here to give you guys the latest. Hit that thumbs up. Turn on that bell for notifications. Get your t-shirts. Get your masks. Patreon.com slash JD from NY206. Follow me on Twitter at JD from NY206 on Twitter and Instagram. And make sure you check out all the other content on the channel right now. Links are down in the description. Thank you guys so much. Hit that thumbs up and I'll see you right back here tonight with more 
Live coverage of NXT. See you guys then.